Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished guests. Welcome to the OFA International Women's Day screening and tonight's very special presentation of Blueback. We hope you enjoyed the movie this evening and you've been having a great night here at the wonderful film.ca cinemas in Oakville. My name is Tyler Collins. I'm the film writer for Oakville News and oakvillenews.org, where you can read us online every day for free at oakvillenews.org. Now that you've finished the movie, we have a very special treat for you. Uh, this, while you are watching the movie live, we have pre-recorded this special interview session with a very special guest attached to the movie. Joining us now is the director, producer, and co-writer of the film Blueback, live from Australia, Robert Connolly. And for us, Hi, it's everyone. Great, but for you, it should be good morning, Robert. Oh, it's 8 a.m. I'm very excited that an audience there has just watched the film. Thank you all for coming along um, on a, such an important day to watch this film. Uh, it's a film that's really been a delight to make and a great adventure. So I really appreciate people on the other side of the world watching the film. Well, we're very grateful to you sharing it with us. Thank you for making this available tonight for our special event. Robert, yeah, we'd like you. to start. Uh, Talk to us, how did the project come about of Blueback? It started as a novel in the late 1990s. How did the ball get rolling, moving it from the, the novel, which is quite famous in Australia, into the motion picture? Yeah, it's a book I loved immediately when I read it. Um, it Tim Winton is one of Australia's greatest authors. He's Booker Prize nominated, and he writes a lot about um, Australian environment. And it's a great deep and profound passion of his. And this incredible novella, um, it's like Australia's equivalent of a book like The Old Man and the Sea. It's a classic. He calls it, you know, a fable for all ages. It's a, a family film, really. And I love the book. I love the environmental themes of it. I loved its ambition to be a story about activis activism. Uh, but also I think what really profoundly touched me was the story of a mother inspiring a child and a child as an adult realising how much uh, she had learned from her mother. Um, so for me, these many and different themes that all converged in this beautiful book really appealed to me to adapt for the screen. Now, you also got a special opportunity, not just your work adapting it for the screen, you and Tim Winton, the book's author, you got to work together writing the screenplay. What was that experience like getting to work directly with the author on the adaptation? Oh, it's amazing, you know, he's such a, a gifted writer. I mean, the, the interesting, um, you know, first step, though, was that uh, I'd been developing it myself for a while. And in the book, it's about a little boy and a mother. And I have two daughters. And I was talking to them about five years ago when I was writing the script. And they were saying, you know, uh, my, my daughter Kitty uh, said to me, you know, what are you doing next? I said, blue back. And she looked at me and she said, great dad, you've got two daughters, another film with a male protagonist as the hero, you know, well done dad, great, you know, and gave me such grief about it. And so my first conversation with Tim was, and then Tim was like, why is it taking so long to make this film? And I said, look, I'm getting grief from my daughters about the protagonist being a boy. Uh, would you be okay if I changed the gender to it being about a young, a young woman? And he said, yes. And so that was the beginning of a journey that was very exciting. I mean, curiously, um, and with the audience watching it on such an important day, the uh, financing of the film moved very fast once we changed the gender to, to a young woman. And I think largely because there were a lot of people that really feel that some of the key figures in the environmental movement are women and a story of the mother and the daughter suited this film quite profoundly in, in an inspiring way. So what are some of the changes that you and Tim worked out as you move your protagonist into the new character of Abby? Well, the bigger questions really, because it's a universal story about young people um, having agency in the world, you know, and I, I get great inspiration from younger people. I think they're caring for the environment in such an extraordinary way. I don't know what it's like there, um, but certainly in Australia, that generation feel cut loose economically. They feel like there's a generation that are holding on to all the wealth and, you know, and it's almost impossible to rent and to move out of home. You know, they're a young generation, that, uh, but they're smart and intelligent and care about the environment. So um, 
I think even changing the gender of the protagonist didn't really shift a kind of fundamental that um, that it is about young people changing the world, which they will, <laughs> uh, and, and with great optimism, I feel. Um, but the, the other big change, uh, if, if people get a chance to read the book, is that written in the late 90s, it was very much about biodiversity. And we know from David Attenborough's work and a lot of environmentalists that, you know, how important biodiversity is. You reintroduce biodiversity, the earth heals itself. It makes sense. Then, biodiversity is all about the health of the ecosystem. That's exactly right. And and it's, a you know, it's a big challenge for the world. But, you know, there are parts of Australia, incredible parts of Australia, where they're fenced off big chunks of um, the bush and they've reintroduced all the, the um, indigenous species of animals back into that area you know that were killed off by cats and other introduced species and those parts of Australia are thriving and they're beautiful to visit and the same is is true if you set up a marine sanctuary and you stop fishing and you know we know from whales for example that you stop killing them they, they've replenished it's a very optimistic um, part of the story but of course since tim wrote the book the other piece of the puzzle um is the world becoming aware of climate change and so the adaptation needed to grapple with that that was different from the book and i think Mia Wojciechowska's character as an environmentalist looking at the bleaching of the coral um, was part of you know the adaptation to make it more contemporary well, that makes sense, because I know uh, coral bleaching has been such a significant part of the science work in Australia of the 21st century, but the book was first written in 1997, so that, that right. couldn't have been part of it. Um, right. talk, to us right. about, talk to us about some of the challenges of shooting underwater. Because it, <laughs> it's very seems, tricky. You know, between uh, the new Black Panther and Avatar, there's a lot of underwater stuff happening. Uh, but yours is is different. You're not doing CGI action effects. You're getting a very realistic environment and trying to capture it as authentically as you can. What, what yeah. are the challenges of getting these underwater environments on screen? Well, the, big, the biggest challenge is it, it's not a natural history documentary. You can put a camera down there. We had a great team. You can film underwater. And, but it's putting actors in that world interacting with marine creatures it, it's so and i didn't want to use stunt performers so i trained uh, ilsa who plays the 15 year old um, abby that everyone's seen today um, lives on a goat farm outside in regional uh, victoria about two hours from here where i am now she uh, doesn't live by the ocean um, and coming from a farm life you know and not ever having professionally acted before it was a huge leap of faith to not only give her this lead role opposite Eric Banner and Mia Wojciechowska but also to train her to free dive she does all her own diving some of the, those shots of her coming off the boat and swimming 20 meters down and swimming 50 meters along the bottom she's doing that on one breath and she'd never done it before it's How now long become did a that training take took a couple of months um but she was a natural you know, the, she, she had a natural kind of, and, and you can see it in the film, she looks effortlessly like she can inhabit that world. But, you know, it's a challenge. The other young actress, um, Ariel Donahue, the, the scene when she goes down to get the ring, when, when her mum drops the ring and she swims down, so stressful. We've got a, 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 they call them a shark mitigation drone going around looking for sharks in the bay, Bruma Bay. And then they go, no sharks, good to go. And then I have to call action and let this little girl swim to the bottom. I mean, it, it was that experience. It was very safe, but it, it had all of the inherent energy and veracity of what it is to film in the real ocean. And I hope the audience today really enjoyed being taken into this real world by the film. Now, one of the, I understand one of the few animals that, that wasn't quite real was the groper fish. That's um, right. <laughs> now, so how did you create the scenes with the groper fish? Look, I love puppets in cinema. You know, I my early cinema going, the 70s, you know, I was born in 1967. So in the 70s, I was watching E.T. I was watching Star Wars with Yoda. Even Jaws is a puppet. And I love that Jaws had a puppet that made people stay out of the ocean. And hopefully my puppet makes people want to swim with a groper. <laughs> um, 
but it's a very expensive puppet and a beautiful four puppeteers controlling it. If people go online and, and, and Google about the puppet, there's a little four minute video of how we made that puppet and created it. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm not, just not a VFX friendly director. You know, I, I'd like mechanical things. I like filming in the real ocean. I like making the actors swim in the real ocean and, you know, a puppet just suited my own philosophy, I guess. Um, we know there are amazing films obviously made with a huge amount of VFX, but it's just not really my my thing. So, Also, you know. I think it so about the natural authenticity of things. It makes sense to have practical, authentic objects in front of you. Well, Mia Wojciechowska talks about that, the scene everyone just saw of... Uh, you know, Mia meeting the groper at the end and, you know, she came out of the water after we filmed that and she said, I forgot it was a puppet. Would her performance have been as delightful as it was? I'm not sure. But um, she certainly felt like it benefited from having a puppet that she could interact with rather than just a green ball on a stick, <laughs> which is what it probably would have been if it was VFA. Let's... Let's talk about working with some of your lead actors, uh, because both Abby and Dora are the two most prevalent characters, but to bring them, there were five actors that played them over various stages. Um, what, right. what was your work as a director like coaching the five actresses as they're playing these two characters, but not together, right? They're playing the same person, yet differently at the same time. What was your relationship like with each of the five performers? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. I mean, I'm really helped in my career by um, working with one of Australia's leading casting directors who helped me find the cast. It's also helpful because she's my wife and uh, she's always in all my work um, helped me find incredible actors. She has great courage. She has a great eye for diversity for children. Um, she's helped to discover some of Australia's great um, actors. People might know Cody Smith McPhee, who was in... Uh, Academy Award nominated for The Power of the Dog and uh, she found him as a little eight-year-old and um, so finding the actors is the first port of call. You've got these three women playing Abby but then you've got to create as a director a sensibility you know I think the little uh, eight-year-old has got all that energy of being eight in the world you know and isn't as formed yet but by the time she's 15 we need to see that she's become more of an intellectual. She's painting and thinking about the ocean. And by 30, she's a world-renowned marine biologist. So I needed to plot a kind of journey from the, from the energy and dynamism of being a young person, not losing that as you grow up, but finding her own sensibility, which is more academic and intellectual than her mother, you know, and Dora as a mother is more an activist and she's not educated and she is struggling to let her daughter go who wants to go off to university and study, but she's also fierce and formidable and passionate. And it's fascinating some of the test screenings we did for young kids before we finished the film, and I couldn't work it out. We asked the kids who their favourite character was, and they all kept saying Dora, and I was like, wow, it's because they all want to have a mum like that who drops a wedding ring in the water and makes them swim down and get it. Um, so I think it's about... It's about uh, casting really well and then creating a, a safe um, journey for that character across the time frame so an audience hopefully people today felt that they were watching like a life lived in the film like the span of generations and that the different cast didn't throw people too much you mentioned one of the big casting changes came at the prodding of your two daughters um, yeah. I'm wondering how much of your own relationship and experience as a father with your daughters influenced some of the acting choices that were made by the women in the movie. How much, how much of the story or what they said, the setting, or their relationship was directly influenced by that with your own girls? Yeah, I, I don't think I could have made the film without the experience of being a father um, and the experience of having these very impressive young daughters and also watching my wife as a mother and also reflecting on my, on my own mother and, and kind of going, well, what do you learn? What, what are the values that are instilled in you um, by the way you're brought up? And, you know, I think the scene where Dora and Abby fight about it and, you know, Abby's saying, I want to change the world and Dora's saying, we've got to save this bay and these two ideas. And, and I thought Rada's, 
beautiful performance in that moment where she looks at her daughter and she loves her daughter and she says, I'm it's just hard to let go. And, you know, I, my daughter, my younger daughter just went to university and moved to college and moved out of home only on last weekend. And I think there'd be people in the audience who would have that experience with their own children or young people who would reflect on their mothers. And um, so I, de I definitely think in any creative work, you have to expose a bit of yourself. You have to show the world a little bit of your own um, experience of the world. My mother um, sadly passed away, you know, um, 20 years ago. And, I, and so, and how did that inform me? How did that sense of loss inform me that then allowed me to, to do that beautiful scene that Tim wrote um, where Mia Wojciechowska, um, Abby, the adult Abby, takes her mother and floats with her in the water you know, I think someone someone early in my career said, you know, without risk, there is no art. And I think the biggest risk that you take as a creative person is to expose your own experience of the world to a broader audience. Mm. But what a gift it is as well, you know, to have an audience sitting there today who've watched the film on the other side of the world and um, considering this work. So, um, you know, it's a delightful journey to be a, a film director. What do you think the greatest challenge was for you and Tim to authentically capture the female voice? Because I know as men, we this is, can be a challenge as a male creator, creating an authentic representation of, of women on screen. Yeah, look, I think that um, I worked with a um, First Nations woman actually, um, who is from the region that we filmed in as my director attachment and she was by my side. I also had a young emerging producer, Tara Bilston, who worked uh, with me on set. And I had a very, we had gender parity on the shoot. So we had so incredible, you know, incredible compared to my early films, which were, you know, it's such a male dominated industry, but we had uh, gender parity as a, a, a principle of our business now, and that created a different atmosphere on set. So I think that you, you can't pretend as a male filmmaker to, to be able to have the point of view that a woman would have as a director directing this material, but you can look to being helped by a creative team with broader uh, gender representation. Uh, but then also I think looking for the universal themes, you know, looking for a universality that is far beyond um, gender about the environment and parenting and being a child and being a parent and, you know, quite, you know, asking all of these things so that it has that broader appeal is really important too. Um, Very but well hey, my, my daughters, they're the Greta Thunberg generation. They're, they're coming for us. Like they love, we did a screen for 16 year olds and there's a scene in, uh, you know, you've just seen the film where Costello says, you know, Abby says, I'll vote against you. And he looks at her and says, not until you're 18. And she looks at him with, and there was a screening we had for all these 15 and 16 year olds and they were hissing. And, and I thought that, because in, in Australia, it's compulsory to, uh, so I'm not sure in Canada, um, whether it is, I know in the US it isn't, but here it's compulsory. So everyone has to vote and you don't vote till you're 18. But uh, there was this great sense that these young people, it's like, yeah, in a couple of years, we are going to be able to vote. <laughs> so, so, and we've got different values, you know, and, um, uh, I don't know. I don't know people in the audience, but I just get really inspired by it, you know, and politically, like my daughters challenge me. They've got, you know, they're, they're the kind of generation that when you're cleaning your teeth, come in and turn the tap off and say, you've let the water run for too long. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, uh, you know, and that was one of my daughters was doing that when she was about eight. So, uh, so bring it on, bring it on. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for that generation. We should empower them and we should give them a great carriage of this incredible world we live in. Wise words indeed. That, uh, that brings me, we're almost out of time, but that's a great segue into one more question I'd like to ask you. Uh, the great Jacques Cousteau, who was an oceanographer, famously said, if you can make people love something, they will care for it. That's right. What does, relating to the film, what does that mean to you? Yeah, it was a big influence, actually, that quote on me, um, because I didn't want to make a film that lectured people. I didn't want to make a pessimistic film about the ocean. I didn't want to make something that made people just despair. You know, I think the, the environmental movement talks 
quite significantly now about optimism. You know, if I tell the audience here, oh, the Great Barrier Reef's going to die, it's called climate change, it's bleaching, you know, it's too late, then people do nothing. But if I tell you that I've met marine biologists that are studying the resilience of coral and have found coral on the, the west coast of Australia that's more resilient than on the east coast, but they're the same genomic structure and they're trying to work out why and, and they're finding so that, that makes people go, wow, this is exciting, you know. So I, I wanted a film to go, you know, at the, we're, we're, in, we're at an incredible civilization right now of smart, intelligent, decent people trying to work this out. So I wanted to make a film that could kind of inspire that. And what's the first way to do that? Show people how beautiful the ocean is. You know, I hope there's people there today that, um, that are inspired by this film, maybe to grab a snorkel and, and go for a swim when they're next traveling somewhere in the world where there's a great marine um, life and wilderness to explore. Well, show us the beauty you have done. Uh, Robert Connolly, I cannot thank you enough for making the time to do this very special Oakville exclusive Q&A with us. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for offering your beautiful movie to us to be screened here for International Women's Day. Uh, I know you can't hear the applause that is clearly starting in the theater right now, <laughs> but I can tell you the audience, the audience is quite pleased and uh, uh, thrilled to have had this movie shared with them today. Robert, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, our Oakville audience. Once again, please uh, thank me. Join me in thanking Robert Connolly joining us from Australia for tonight's event. Thanks, everyone.